Welcome back, Warrior. We are reading Alma chapter 37. Man, we are going through this. Okay, so remember this is still a chat from Alma to his son, Helaman. Okay, and Helaman is the same Helaman who is over the stripling warriors. Don't you just wish you could like be there? Ma'am. That that time would have been awesome. Okay. Although that means I would have want war, which I don't like. So maybe I don't want to be there. <laughs> kind of funny how that works, right? It's like actually no, never mind. That's war. I don't want to be there. But sometimes it feels like we have real war going on because even though our war is spiritual, feels exhausting like really hard and sometimes don't you wonder like why certain days are so like drudgy i don't know how to i don't know how else to say it but like i i think it's because our spirit is fighting so hard that when it gets really drudgy or like really like oh, i just need one of those like days where you just do nothing or like those days where you're just like go go going i don't know what which one it is but I think after you do the go, go, going, you're like, yes, right? Then you need one of those, like, just need a breathe day. And I think that those days are so good for us um, to rest. And I also think that those are the days that Satan is trying to attack us the most. And it's so good for us not to get discouraged by ourselves, like show ourselves some self-compassion because we are taking a rest day, which is great. Even athletes need rest and recovery. And so um, I think it's important for us to remember that just because we don't have go, go, go days every day doesn't mean we have to be so hard on ourselves when we have a rest day. Because I know what that's like to have a rest day, but you don't realize like you didn't wake up planning on having a rest day. You know, you were like, I'm going to be go, go, going. But then your body is like, no, we're resting today. And you're like, what? And so, yeah, just have a little bit of self-compassion. Take some serious deep breaths and know that you're okay. Everything's going to be fine. You'll have your go, go, go days soon. But today is a rest day. Um, anyway, I don't know how I got there, but... <laughs> But anyways, okay, uh, chapter third, but this is some good, some good uh, counsel, right? Okay, chapter 37, the plates of brass and other scriptures are preserved to bring souls to salvation. And aren't I glad that they did, right? The Jaredites were destroyed because of their wickedness. Their secret oaths and covenants <clears throat> must be kept from the people. Counsel with the Lord in all thy doings. As the Liahona guided the Nephites, so the word of Christ leads men to eternal life. Okay, actually, one second. Okay, so, here we go. We are reading verse 1. And now, my son Helaman, I command you that you take the records which have been entrusted with me. And I also command you that you keep a record of this people according as I have done upon the plates of Nephi, and keep all these things sacred, which I have kept, even as I have kept them. For it is for a wise purpose that they are kept. Like, what would we do without these scriptures? I never want to know. I never want to find out. Uh -oh. Accidentally clipped it on my necklace. Okay. Um, they are so precious to me. As you know, I read them every day. And they bring me great strength and bring me closer to my Savior, Jesus Christ. I might not know them as well as scholars or people who can remember things <laughs> like scripture verses and things, but 
I don't love them any less than they do. Um, there's some talks that the Come Follow Me lesson manual suggests that we read about uh, the love of scriptures and how they have been preserved in our day. So there's the talk called The Blessing of Scripture from Elder D. Todd Christofferson in the 2010 April General Conference. Then there's, um, oh, I guess it's one talk and then the song As I Search the Holy Scriptures, right? That one's such a good, such a good hymn. Um, number 277, and then there's a video that uh, is found in the Gospel Library, and it's called Alma Testifies to His Son, Helaman. So, anyways, love those ideas. There's like so many options for us to teach our kids, right? Okay, so verse 3, and these plates of brass... <clears throat> oh, really quick. There was... Uh, it says, the collection of records had grown over the years, and so he will be receiving stewardship over the following things. Okay, so I didn't know these things, but here they go. We have over 500 years of Nephite records, the plates of brass, the, did you hear me say that? The plates of brass, the 24 Jaredite plates, the interpreters, and the Liahona. So he has like five things he's got to keep track of. Now, with people who move around as much as they do, that's a lot of stuff to like haul with you everywhere. And not to mention that they cannot be very lightweight, right? So anyway, it's kind of crazy. So it was like a real big deal to have this stuff. Okay, then verse three, and these plates of brass, which contain these engravings, which have the records of the Holy Scriptures upon them, which have the genealogy of our forefathers, even from the beginning, behold, it has been prophesied Sorry, now I'm turning on my walking. It has been prophesied by our fathers that they should be kept and handed down from one generation to another and be kept and preserved by the hand of the Lord until they should go forth unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people that they shall know of the mysteries contained thereon. Oh man, that's us. They're talking about us getting it. They needed to be preserved for us. Like, do we ever do that, do things with that much intention, you know? Um, we don't. We really don't, you know? Verse 5, And now behold, if they are kept, they must retain their brightness. Yea, and they will retain their brightness. Yea, and also shall all the plates which do contain that which is holy writ. Now you may suppose that this is foolishness in me, but behold, I say unto you, that by small and simple things are great things brought to pass, and small means in many instances doth confound the wise, and the Lord God doth work by means to bring about his great and eternal purposes, and by very small means the Lord doth confound the wise, and bringeth about the salvation of many souls. Mm, I love that scripture, that by small and simple things are great things brought to pass. We can liken that to everything. That is small. Like first, we're, we're talking about the scriptures, right? Because they're small. Or for Helaman, he could be thinking of small things like just writing on plates would be like a small thing. Um, I mean, it was probably a big thing, but by small letters, right? Tiny things. Um, planting things, their small seeds, brings great things. Um, babies, babies being born. Um, are small and simple and then they become great human beings and contributors to society and they're just awesome humans um, small things like paying people compliments you know instead of being a bully you you're kind and a lot of kindness can bring about so much good in somebody's life and the lives of those around you um what other small things? Just nice notes. They're small. They're little. Same. Bring about a lot of good in your relationship as a spouse. You know, if your spouse gives you like a small note that says that they're thinking about you, that can go a long way. Um, or like something that they appreciate about you. 
the nails in Christ's hands, they're technically really small in size, but brought about all that is good. Um, so many, so many things, you know, those, just like all the little things, the, a smile can brighten someone's day, the nails in a home are so small, but you need a lot of them to make a giant house or a mansion or whatever, um, tile, tile is small, and a lot of tiles can make a big mosaic. We, we went when we went to Greece, they had these mosaics that were like giants, so big, and they used these super tiny little tiles and just like glued them all on, and it was amazing. And I'm just like, wow. So those are tiny things, chocolate chips, small things. Great things come to pass on my hips. <laughs> um, what else? Truths. When you tell, when you choose to tell the truth instead of a lie. When you're in a relationship, that goes into your trust bucket. Like you can trust this person because they just told you a truth, and so many truths lead to a really good, trustworthy relationship, right? Anyways, so many things are small and great things are brought to pass. Like my daughter, she has a tiny little bunny, stuffy, and she can't sleep without it. And kids sleeping is a big thing. So you know we're about to find that bunny every night. <laughs> Anyways, love that. Uh, there's a quote from Elder L. Whitney Clayton from April 2017 General Conference. He says, A few years ago, I spoke with a young bishop who was spending hours each week counseling with members of his ward. He made a striking observation. The problems that members of his ward faced, he said, were those faced by church members everywhere. Issues such as how to establish a happy marriage, struggles with balancing work, family, and church duties. Like that's forever. We're always trying to figure that out. Challenges with the word of wisdom, with employment or with pornography or trouble gaining peace about a church policy or historical question they didn't understand. His counsel to ward members very often included getting back to simple practices of faith, such as studying the Book of Mormon, paying tithing, and serving in the church with devotion. Frequently, however, their response to him was ones of skepticism. I don't agree with you, Bishop, they said. We all know those are good things to do. We talk about those things all the time in the church. But I'm not sure you're understanding me. What does doing any of those things have to do with facing, with the issues I'm facing? We'll answer that ourselves also, but we're going to hear what Elder Clayton has to say. It's a fair question, he says. Over time, that young bishop and I have observed that those who are deliberate about doing the small and simple things, obeying in seemingly little ways, are blessed with faith and strength that go far beyond the actual acts of obedience themselves. And in fact, may seem totally unrelated to them it may seem hard to draw a connection between the basic daily acts of obedience and solutions to the big complicated problems we face. But they are related. Small acts of faith, even when they seem insignificant or entirely disconnected from the specific problems that vex us, bless us in all we do. End quote. I love that so much. And it's so true, like, it's hard when, when sisters come to me and ask me what are things that they need to do to experience healing for themselves because their husbands have just disclosed or they discovered their 
addiction to pornography or sexual acts or whatever, um, their betrayal. It's hard to put it in simple words because there's so much feeling and emotion and hurt and pain and suffering and anger that that you don't just want to address it with simple solutions like, well, just keep doing what you're doing um, and go to the temple more because that's where the strength, that's where the Lord will strengthen us because some sisters don't want to hear about going to the temple. But that's the one place that we, we are promised so much strength and keep reading your scriptures because it's so important to feel that love that love from the Lord. Um, and then the other one is to serve others. And, you know, it's hard because you're like, we, I don't want to serve other people, but it's what we are promised that it's through a, another person that the Lord will meet our needs. And so we need to have that connection with more sisters. And, and we need to have that, um, that sisterhood. And so going to church helps us, but it's so hard too, because that's like the first place we can, the Lord has set up for us to, to gain that sisterly connection. But sadly, we're too, um, Satan has convinced us to be too ashamed of our problems that we can't reach out to those sisters that are closest to us. And so we end up needing to stay isolated and so we never share but the lord has set it up so that we could be this really tight-knit group of of sisters and so supporting one another but if, if if we don't find that then we have to seek it um elsewhere and so i always recommend going to the worth program with life-changing services and i think it's lifechangingservices.org and finding the worth program there that's where i found my sisters, because I really wanted to share in my word, but at the time it just wasn't the right way and the right thing to do at that time. Since then, obviously, we've been sharing, and as we are open and sharing, um, sisters have been able to reach out to me, and I've been able to help, but it's so hard to, to simplify things, and reading your patriarchal blessing, like, I found that those five things that we need to do to crush Satan is that crush framework where you connect with Christ first. And how do you connect with Christ? Well, in the scriptures and through going to the temple. And then what's next is H. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, we're not spelling Christ. We're spelling crush. R is the next one. It's remember who you are. You, you read things and you um, recite affirmations and power statements and statements of control and future statements and um, what else? And going to the temple provides us with so many great affirmations. When I was doing initiatories, they're so fantastic. And reading our patriarchal blessing is such a great way to recite those things to help strengthen us. And then the U is to uncover our gifts, like don't bury them. You know, we've been doing so much for others. It's time for us to use our gifts and uncover them ourselves. And th those things that we've been pushing away because we think we can't use our gifts, but we need to. And S is sharpening the sword and, and uh, or you can uncover new gifts, you know, it's not just the gifts we, but like that's self-care. When you get to use your gifts, it's self-care. Um, cause those are God given and, and God gave it to us to, to use his weapons so that we could fight against the adversary cause he knew it was going to be hard. And then on the, the S is to sharpen the sword. So sharpen, meaning like use those gifts that you just uncovered to serve those around you in like a comfort, comfort, comfortable environment or in the comfort of your uh, immediate circle, right? There's like different circles of comfort or different circles of trust. And so you can use your gifts to bless those in your home, bless your neighbors, bless your family. Okay. And then H to heed 
the promptings of the Lord. Like, what are those things he has been telling you to do? Not just now in the safety of that comfort circle, but like, how can we expand that more? How can we, how can we share our gifts with more of the world? And how can we bring more people to Christ? Um, because that is what he gave us our gifts for. As we serve those around us, as we serve others, we are serving God and Satan hates that. And so we are able to crush Satan with all, with, as we do that. And it accelerates our healing so much because we're able to use those gifts in a way that they were meant to be used. And so anyways, and those are small and simple things too. Our gifts, they're so small to us, especially if we've made them smaller, <laughs> But we don't need to keep our, our gifts small. We don't need to keep ourselves small because of others or making people feel bad. We can bring our gifts to light um, to bring more people to, to Christ in the way that only we can. Um, anyways, I can go off on that for a while. But, but th that's, I just love that he said that he said that small acts of faith, even when they seem insignificant or entirely disconnected, from the specific problems that vex us, bless us in all that we do, in all that we do. And we know that there's no such thing as a, uh, or that in the Doctrine and Covenants, we learn that everything is spiritual unto the Lord, which means it's all connected, right? As I work on my business or as I work on things that are totally unrelated to the gospel, I use my my knowledge, my faith. I, I pray to Heavenly Father so much. For example, this past month, or for, well, I have so many ways that I pray to Heavenly Father, but this past uh, week I've been realizing, oh, I've neglected my other business and my bills are about to come up and how am I going to pay for things? And I was just saying prayers, you know, and he has sent customers my way without even me trying so hard. And so it has something that I know that he is supporting me in, even though it's totally unrelated to anything that has to do with ministering or, you know, talking about Jesus Christ or anything like that. It's, it's totally unrelated, it seems like, or unrelated to things, but I trust him and I confide in him in those things that are temporal and spiritual or physical and spiritual or emotional and spiritual, you know, all the things, everything he says is spiritual unto him. So if that's true, then we're okay to talk about it and talk to him about all of the things that matter in our lives. Because what if we care about it, then he cares about it. Okay. Um, verse eight. And now it has a hitherto been wisdom in God. Wait, wait, wait. I think... We have another quote. Hold on. The small and simple quote. And this one's found in the Come Follow Me manual this time. And it is from Elder Dallin, or President Dallin H. Oaks. He says, let's see. Let me find the beginning of the quote. Oh, never mind. I guess, I guess it's more of a talk. So he said, the idea is if you were going to teach this principle to someone, what examples from nature or everyday life would you use to illustrate it? Okay, so I guess I kind of illustrated it a little bit. You can find some in President Dallin H. Oaks' message, small and simple things from the April 2018 General Conference. And I love this question. What are some small and simple things that bring you closer to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ? Hmm, love it. Okay, um, and we talked about some of those. Okay, so now, verse 8, And now it has hitherto been wisdom in God that these things should be preserved, for, behold, they have enlarged the memory of this people. Yea, and convinced many of their error of the error of their ways, and brought them to the knowledge of their God unto, salva unto the salvation of their souls. Yea, I say unto you, were it not for these things that these records do contain, which are on these plates, Ammon and his brethren could not have convinced so many thousands of the Lamanites of the incorrect tradition of their fathers. Yea, these records and their words brought them unto repentance. That is, they brought them to the knowledge of the Lord their God and to rejoice in Jesus Christ, their Redeemer. 
Verse 10. And who knoweth but what they will be the means of bringing many thousands of them, yea, and also many thousands of our stiff-necked brethren, the Nephites, who are now hardening their hearts in sin and iniquities to the knowledge of their Redeemer. Now these mysteries are not yet fully made known unto me, therefore I shall forbear. And it may suffice if I only say they are preserved for a wise purpose, which purpose is known unto God, for he doth counsel and wisdom over all his works, and his paths are straight, and his course is one eternal round. So he's just saying, like, I don't even know why I'm doing this. I don't even know why we're saving these records. Maybe he got a vision of, like, us reading them. Maybe. But maybe he could have also been shown a vision of us not reading them. Because there's a lot of that going on, too. Um, and that would have been disheartening. Especially for them. But aren't we just so glad? I wonder if... It was just the best day ever when they were able to see how the Lord was preserving these amazing scriptures for us and to see them brought to pass, like just in print that the first person could read them, you know, like I bet that was such an awesome payday. I like to tell our boys, our kids all the time, I'm like, do something today that your future self will be proud of. And sometimes that means I'm meal prepping or just get some snacks ready or, you know, maybe set my clothes out for the gym or just like small things like that, that can help me in my future self, right? And I think this is something that they did is, you know, do something today, like preserving those scriptures so that their future self will be proud of it. And I bet they are so proud of their hard work and that they can see that their hard work was consecrated for their good and for our good. So I love that so much. Okay, um, verse 12. And it may suffice if I only say that they are preserved for a wise purpose. Oh wait, I already just read that. <laughs> So verse 13, Oh, remember, remember, my son Helaman, how strict are the commandments of God. And he said, If you will keep my commandments, you shall prosper in the land. But if you keep not his commandments, he shall be cut off from his presence. And now, remember, my son, that God has entrusted you with these things, which are sacred, which he has kept sacred, and also which he will keep and preserve for a wise purpose in him, that he may show forth his power unto future generations. Okay, so there's a quote from Elder Ezra Taft Benson. I mean, President Ezra Taft Benson. <laughs> October 1988 General Conference. Ooh, I love this. It is. Now I need like a tissue. <clears throat> the time is long overdue for a massive flooding of the earth with the Book of Mormon. For the many reasons which the Lord has given, a, has given in this age of the electronic media and the mass distribution of the printed word god will hold us accountable if we do not now move the book of mormon in a monumental way we have the book of mormon we have the members we have the missionaries we have the resources and the world has the need the time is now end quote isn't that amazing okay what's yes what's up okay in april 2011 which was the 181st anniversary of the publication of the book of mormon the church announced that they had printed over 150 million copies of the Book of Mormon. Can you believe that? The church news explains by 1990, the 50th millionth copy had been printed for distribution by members and missionaries. That number doubled by 2000, with the church printing on average of one copy every seven seconds over the next decade. A rare a rate the church has sustained to reach the projected 150 million by 2011. The majority of the printing is done in Salt Lake City, Utah, USA, but presses in Brazil, Germany, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan are also used. End quote. Okay. Wow. That's Church News. Book of Mormon reaches 150 million copies by April 20th, 2011. So prophets of old and prophets today have testified of the importance of this book. Now it is up to us to be living witnesses of the power of this book of scripture and to seek to be one of the few men slash women on earth that Elder Bruce Armour Conkey teaches of. 
teaches of. Yes, and here's his quote. It says, few men on earth and women, either in or out of the church, have caught the vision of what the Book of Mormon is all about. Few are they among us who know the part it has played and will yet play in preparing the way for the coming of him whom it is a new witness. The Book of Mormon shall so affect affect us that the whole earth and all its peoples will have been influenced and governed by it. There is no greater issue ever to confront mankind in modern times than this. Is the Book of Mormon the mind and will and voice of God to all men? Oh, wow. End quote. So I'm guessing, so this is the, the book called Millennial Messiah, page 159 by Elder Bruce Harmon Conkey. Now, I appreciate that people use the word men in things. And I know that some women really get offended if people use the word men, but not women. And so I'll kind of throw it in there, but not because I'm trying to really be sassy about it or anything, but I want to make sure, like, I don't want to take away from their message because I believe that it wasn't necessarily their purpose to exclude women. But I think that what that he's trying to do is he's trying to teach men how to be men. And he's trying to help them know, like, read the Book of Mormon. And now what else can you do with it, right? Like, if they read the Book of Mormon, they won't have these struggles with pornography and these addictions of sexual nature and won't be, will be able to uh, refuse the temptations of the adversary and will be able to overcome those things, those weaknesses that he, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, as a man, must know, which is why he was specifically see saying things like men, right? And so that's what I, whenever I think of people in general conference talking about men and not necessarily using women in their statements, it's not because they're trying to ignore us. But let's be honest, who reads the scriptures more in your, in your family? I'm not talking about while people were serving in missions, because that I feel like doesn't really count because you had somebody who was holding you accountable every day um, and you were required to do that and you had like a zone leader and you had like all these things, right? So, um, and I know that there are a lot of men who do read scriptures a lot, probably more than women, but let's be honest, if the men were reading more scriptures, I don't think they'd have that big of a problem um, as they currently do with the lust and sexual addictions that they do so there's your answer from a man trying to teach men now us as women i love learning from sister sherry do she's amazing and so if you prefer people to tell you things what you need to do that are female find her talks find all the sister talks they're the best right um but I love apostles. I love learning from apostles, prophets, and their men. So it's fine if they want to focus on telling the men what to do because they have more of a problem than I do. Great, <laughs> right? And and so like I'm fine. I'm fine with that. Okay. Because men should teach men how to be men. It just makes it just makes sense in the whole realm of things. Okay, um, verses 15 to 20. Now I'm going to get like all kinds of comments about like sexist comments, aren't I? It's fine though. <laughs> we can handle it. Okay, 15. And now behold, I tell you by the spirit of prophecy that if ye transgress the commandments of God, behold, these things which are sacred shall be taken away from you by the power of God and ye shall be delivered up unto Satan that he may sift you as chaff before the wind. Mm. That's the warning. And it's so true, right? Because if we don't read these scriptures, what does he say? We're going to be under Satan's influence, and it's so true. But if you keep my, but if you keep the commandments of God and do with these things which are sacred, according to that which the Lord doth command you, so he says we need to study them, not just read them. For you must appeal unto the Lord for all things whatsoever you must do with them. Behold, no power of earth or hell can take them from you. For God is powerful to the fulfilling of all his words. Yeah, like, I think, 
Compare your life from when you read a ton of scriptures all the time and the influence of the adversary, right? So you're reading a lot of scriptures, the influence of the adversary, your ability to fight back temptations or torture is increased while Satan's influence on you is decreased, right? And now compare that to when you were not reading as much scriptures, the temptations, the torture goes up and the reading amount goes down. You literally cannot survive spiritually without what it, well, President Nelson says, without the influence, the constant influence of the Holy Ghost. How do you keep the comp constant influence of the Holy Ghost? By reading scriptures. Oh, thank you, miss. Um, not, I'm not ready for it yet, but we will soon. So if you keep, and as you continue to read the scriptures, you will have that Holy Ghost with you. And then, and then instead of Satan winning, we will start winning, right? And we will start winning our battles. And I understand what you're saying. We don't have enough time in the day to read that much scripture. But you can do the brownie bites method where you just nibble on some every bit of the day. And it, even though it seems like it doesn't do anything, guess what? When you take nibbles off brownies, they make a difference on your hips, don't they? And so I'm pretty sure nibbling on scriptures will make a difference in your spiritual self as well, in your spiritual nourishment. And so um, just take those minutes, take those seconds, take whatever you need to connect with Christ throughout your day if you can't do like one big sit down. Because I get it. Uh, there, It's busy, you know. But you also need to make time. The Lord loves effort because effort brings rewards is what uh, President Nelson says too. So stop pushing. Um, oh, okay. Anyways, um, so yeah, compare those times when you have been reading the scriptures and what Satan's influence was on you then and decide for yourself like what you need to do, right? And guaranteed if you were reading like, oh, and what was I was going to say one more time is if you've been reading five minutes a day every day, okay, that's better than nothing. But as adults, let's be honest with ourselves, is five minutes a day of dedicating our time to the Lord going to be enough spiritual nourishment for the attacks of the adversary that we are getting in our day now? Yeah, no, it's not going to work, okay? Five minutes a day is great for when you were like a child, okay? When you were like, before you got baptized, five minutes a day, that's a good idea. Five minutes a day is better than zero minutes a day, okay? Yes. But we need to be real with ourselves. And if we've been doing five minutes a day, let's say we have been doing five minutes a day. Okay, I'm not trying to shame anybody, but I'm trying to help you realize the level of armor we... Uh-oh. So I paused it and I did not unpause. <laughs> so what was I going to say? Hold on. Okay, what was I going to say that I just recorded and it was not recording? So what I was going to say was, if you used to be at a, let me see if I can shrink it down because it was kind of long when I explained it. If you used to be at a specific level of time with the Lord, so let's say five minutes a day, you used to do that. And now it no longer sustains you or provides you the strength that you need. And you're wondering what's wrong. Well, just like your muscles need more weight as you increase in strength, you will need more time with the Lord to continue to strengthen yourself. And so five minutes a day was sufficient for our needs back in the day, right? And now we need to up our level of commitment of time. So we need 10 minutes a day to study with the Lord and so forth, right? Our level of uh, time that we need to study, that we need connection with the Lord will increase over time as we continue to uh, increase our relationship with him and our battles change over time and so we might need more strength depending on the battles that we're fighting and there might be different seasons of battles which require different work and so anyways what I'm trying to say is just stay close to spirit so that you know what level of uh 
time you need for the Lord to help strengthen you? How much time do you need with the Lord now versus then? You know, also when you're a child, you don't need as much time because you're just learning things, right? You're trying to get excited about scriptures. You're trying to learn. And so maybe five minutes is fine when you're a kid, but as an adult, you're going to need, you have totally different battles to fight and you're going to need maybe to up that a couple notches. So just the President Nelson talks about that the thing that we need the most is to stay, uh, to have the Holy Ghost with us at all times. And to do that, we need to read the scriptures. And um, even though it does require a lot of work, we also know that President Nelson says that the Lord loves effort because effort brings rewards. And so we do need to put forth a lot of effort to connect with Christ. Sometimes it requires more than we really want because it's not as easy as just turning it on and there it is. But the world will do that. So anyway, Satan will distract us with all the things. And so it is our job to stay focused on our goals and on our strength to keep the spirit with us. Okay, on our job to keep the spirit with us. Okay, here we go. Verse 16. Did I read this one? Uh, yeah, no, didn't read it. Okay, but if you keep the commandments of God and do with the thing with these things which are sacred according to that which the Lord doth command you, for you must appeal unto the Lord for all things whatsoever you must do with them. Behold, no power of earth or hell can take them from you, for God is powerful to fulfilling all his words. Right? Exactly what I just said. In better words, of course. <laughs> for he will fulfill all his promises which he has shall make unto you for he has fulfilled his promises which he has made unto our fathers for he promised unto them that he would preserve these things for a wise purpose in him that he might show forth his power unto future generations and now behold one purpose hath he fulfilled even to the restoration of many thousands of the lamanites to the knowledge of the truth and he saw or and he hath shown forth his power in them and he will also show his forth show forth his power in them unto future generations. Therefore, they shall be preserved. Therefore, I command you, my son Helaman, that ye be diligent in fulfilling all my words, and that ye be diligent in keeping the commandments of God as they are written. Okay, so we have another quote. Uh, nope, just kidding. We do not. <laughs> okay. Um, so Helaman is being given charge of something very, very special, and so he is also given very strict commands. If he breaks the commandments, these things will be taken away and he will be in Satan's hands. <sighs> yes. But if he keeps the commandments, no power of earth or hell can take them from you. And I love that. That's such a great promise to have. This command is very similar. Like who does not want the powers of hell to take, take us over? We need the power of heaven and <clears throat> the power of hell or earth won't take us over if we can keep the commandments. So that is the promise we need. So this command is very similar to the command that Moroni gave Joseph Smith when he received the gold plates on the 22nd day of September, 1827, having gone as usual at the end of another year to the place where they were deposited, the same heavenly messenger delivered them up to me with this charge that I should be responsible for them, that if I should let them go carelessly or through any neglect of mine, I should be cut off, but that if I would use my, all my endeavors to preserve them until the messenger should call for them, they should be protected. End quote. Okay, verses 21 to 30. Okay, this is a long chapter, peeps. This goes to 47. Okay, hold on. My knees are starting to hurt. Oh boy. Okay. Oh, I did want to get my. Oh. Oh, get my. Word. Okay, verse twenty-one. And now I will speak unto this unto you concerning those twenty-four plates, that ye keep them, that the mysteries and the works of darkness and their secret works, or the secret works of those people who have been destroyed may be made manifest unto this people. Yea, all their murders and robbings and their plunderings and all their wickedness and abominations may be made manifest unto this people. Yea, and that ye preserve these interpreters. 
I love that. Like, so this is the Jaredite record. Why do we need to know about secret works and plunderings and robbings and murders and things? Is because I think it's so that we know that Satan isn't trying anything new on anybody. It's all the same old junk. And we can be either we can take those things as tactics and learn from them and, and and be able to recognize them when we see them. I love, there's a quote from, I can't remember who it is, but he says that the Book of Mormon is uh, something that shows us the tactics of the adversary, right? And it's it's so true. It's like, it's like it's not hidden and these are not new things. They've been happening since the beginning of time. And Satan just tries the same old, same old, because he has data of, of what works and what. And so he knows that those are going to be some of the things that work on us because we're all human. And so he tortures us and he tempts us. And I love Maurice Harker always. Uh, he's the founder of Life Changing Services. He, he says, uh, Satan tortures women and tempts men. And if you don't believe me, why don't you just think about it just a second? <laughs> um, but I love it because that's what he's found throughout his years of doing his practice. And so when we have data, we can fight with, we can fight back with data. And that is what the Book of Mormon does for us. It gives us data about what happened in the past so that we can be like, wait, that's not new. Satan's trying that on me too. And I can see that in my life. So anyways, I love, I love being able to identify tactics of the adversary. Did you put something in here? Yep. Uh-oh. Who is it? Is that bunny? No, is that a ball? What is that? Oh, Hugh, I'm sorry, Hugh. Flora's putting stuff under here. No. Oh, Hugh. Okay, this wastes my time. You know what that means? That means I won't have time to read books if you waste my time. Okay, because I have very limited time. Our time is limited. Time is precious. Okay. Here we are. She's trying to put stuff underneath the treadmill, and I'm glad that you didn't get hurt because that would have been worse. Okay. I know you're trying to bounce, and it's Sounds like a fun game, but I thought you wanted me to read a book to you. She wants me to read, and I told her that I could read after we read this book. Um, okay, so for behold, the Lord saw that his people began to work in darkness, yea, work secret murders and abominations. Therefore, the Lord said, if they did not repent, they should be destroyed from off the face of the earth. And the Lord said, I will prepare unto my servant Ga Gazellum, a stone which shall shine forth in darkness unto light that I may discover unto my people who serve me, that I may discover unto them the works of their brethren, yea, their secret works, their works of darkness, and their wickedness and abominations. And now, my son, these interpreters were prepared that the word of God might be fulfilled, which he spake, saying, this is the Lord's promise, I will bring forth out of darkness unto light all their secret works and their abominations, and except they repent, I will destroy them from off the face of the earth, and I will bring to light all their secrets and abominations unto every nation that shall hereafter, hereafter possess the land. And now, my son, we see that they did not repent, therefore they have been destroyed, and thus for the word of God has been fulfilled. Yea, their secret abominations have been brought out of darkness and made known unto us. And now, my son, I command you that ye retain all their oaths and their covenants and their agreements in their secret abominations, yea, in all their signs and their wonders, Yea, ye shall keep from this people that they know them not, lest peradventure they should fall into darkness also and be destroyed. For behold, there is a curse upon all this land, that destruction shall come upon all those workers of darkness, according to the power of God, when they are fully ripe. Therefore, I desire that this people might not be destroyed. Therefore, ye shall keep these secret plans of their oaths and their covenants from this people, and only their wickedness and their murders and their abominations shall ye make known unto them. And ye shall teach them to abhor such wickedness and abominations and murders. And ye shall also teach them that these people were destroyed on account of their wickedness and abominations and their murders. For behold, they murdered all the prophets of the Lord who came 
among them to declare unto them concerning their iniquities. And the blood of those whom they murdered did cry unto the Lord their God for vengeance upon those who were their murderers. And thus the judgments of God did come upon these workers of darkness and secret combinations. Oh, yeah? Oh, boy. He's a good shoot. All right. Um, let's see. So some some quotes here, or some some feedback from the redhead hostess said, well, lots of things, actually. So this people had great righteousness and great wickedness, and ultimately, after many centuries, they destroyed themselves. In a great and last battle, there was a prophet named Ether who hid the 24 plates, which the Nephites found, and Mosiah the second then translated them. Then years later, when Moroni was witnessed, witnessing the destruction of the Nephites, he abridged, shortened the Jaredite records, and added them to his father's Mormon's record, which were the gold plates. Later, Joseph Smith will not receive the 24 plates, but he will receive Moroni's abridgment of them, and they are in the Book of Mormon, now known as the Book of Ether. So, that's awesome. Therefore, we can see how important all these records will be. And Alma gave Helaman very specific instruction about what he was to do with the 24 plates. Some wicked Jaredites had secret abominations that included oaths and covenants, and it ultimately led to their destruction. Alma is warning Helaman to be careful what the Nephites learn. Let them know that these people were destroyed on account of their wickedness and abominations and their murders. But retain all their oaths and their covenants and their agreements in their secret uh, abominations, yea, and all their signs and their wonders. Ye shall keep from this people that they know them not, lest peradventure they should fall into darkness also and be destroyed. So let the people know the history, but don't give wicked men tools because they will continue the evils of the past. Yeah, like that's something else too, entirely. <laughs> like, um, I was going to give an example, but it's kind of long. So, and this is already working super long. And this is exactly what will happen in Helaman 2. Kishkumen will introduce secret combinations. These secret covenants will not come from the records, but from Satan. And they will introduce great wickedness upon, among the Nephites. Of course, it always comes from Satan. Where else is it coming from? You know? So in verse 23, we read about a promise from the Lord that he will prepare unto my servant Gazellum a stone which shall shine forth in the darkness unto light, that I may discover unto my people who will serve me. And so there are various interpretations of what Gazellum refers to. Helaman is receiving interpreters that can be used by God's servants. So Gazellum could mean the actual stones and were names for the seer stones that both Mosiah and Joseph e. Smith use to translate the Jaredite records, which reveal ways that Satan works to destroy entire civilizations. Or Gazellum could refer to a prophet who used the stones. So the question is whether Gazellum is a person or a stone. Either way, the promise is that Satan's ways will not remain hidden. Right? There will always be exposed. Okay, verses 31 to 37. Yea, and a cursed... Wait, sorry. Yea, and a curse be the land forever and ever unto those workers of darkness and secret combinations, even unto, des unto destruction, except they repent before they are fully right. And now, my son, remember the words which I have spoken unto you. Trust not those secret plans unto this people, but teach them an everlasting hatred against sin and iniquity. Preach unto them repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach them to humble themselves and to be meek and lowly in heart. Teach them to withstand every temptation of the devil and with their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach them to never be weary of good works, but to be meek and lowly in heart, for such shall find rest to their souls. Oh, I love these. Oh, remember, my son, and learn wisdom in thy youth. Yea, learn in thy youth to keep the commandments of God. This is a scripture mastery, right? Yea, and cry unto God for all my for all thy support. Yea, let all thy doings be unto the Lord, and whithersoever thou goest, let it be in the Lord. Yea, let all thy thoughts be directed unto the Lord. Yea, let the affections of thy heart be placed upon the Lord forever. Counsel with the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for good. Yea, when thou, thy lou, bit of it, when thou liest down at night, lie down unto the Lord, and he may watch over you in your sleep. And when thou risest in the morning, let thy heart be full of thanks unto God. And if ye do these things, ye shall be lifted up at the last day. And now, let's see, hold on. Just kidding. We have a quote from Elder D. Todd Christopherson. 
titled How to Make Christ the Center of Our Lives from the New Era, October 2016. So you and I can put Christ at the center of our lives and become one with him as he is one with the Father. We could begin by stripping everything out of our lives and then putting it back together in priority order with the Savior at the center. We would first put in place the things that make it possible always to remember him. Frequent prayer, studying and pondering the scriptures, thoughtfully studying of apost apostolic teachings, weekly preparation to partake of the sacrament worthily, Sunday worship, recording and remembering what the Spirit and experience what the Spirit and experience teach us about discipleship. There may be other things that will come to your mind, particularly suited to you at this point in your life. Once adequate time and means for these matters for wait, once adequate time and means for these matters for centering our lives in Christ have been put in place, we can begin to add other responsibilities and things of value insofar as time and resources will permit, such as education, family responsibilities, and personal personal advocations. Advocations. In this way, the essential will not be crowded out, for our lives will be merely good, and things of lesser value will take lesser priority or fall away altogether. End quote. That was really good. If we want to know how to set up our day, week, month, this right here is where it's at. Okay, verses 38 to 47. Here we go. And now, my son, I have somewhat to say concerning the thing which our fathers call a ball or director, or our fathers called it Liahona, which is being interpreted as a compass, and the Lord prepared it. And behold, there cannot any man work after the manner of so curious a workmanship. And behold, it was prepared to show unto our fathers the course which they should travel in the wilderness. So this is the Liahona, right? And it did work for them according to their faith in God. Therefore, they had faith to believe that God could cause that those spindles should point the way they should go. Behold, it was done. Therefore, they had this miracle and also many other miracles wrought by the power of God day by day. Nevertheless, because those miracles were worked by by small means, it did show unto the mem unto them marvelous works. They were slothful and forgot to e to exercise their faith and diligence, and then those marvelous works ceased, and they did not pro progress in their journey. Therefore, they tarried in the wilderness, or did not travel a direct course and were afflicted with hunger and thirst because of their transgressions. And now, my son, I would that ye should understand that these things are not without a shadow. For as our fathers were slothful to give heed to the, this compass, now these things were temporal. They did not prosper. Even so, it is with things which are spiritual. I love this. He's trying to tell them, like, this is the, the compass, the liahona, was something that was physical in our lives that was just like a representation of what the spirit is like in our lives. Right, and so it says, "For behold, it is easy to give heed to the word of Christ, which will point you to the, point you point to you a straight course to eternal bliss, as it was for our fathers to give heed to this compass, which would point unto them a straight course to the promised land." And now I say, "Is there not a type in this thing? For just as surely as the director did bring our fathers by following its course to the promised land, shall the words of Christ, if we follow their course, carry us beyond this veil of sorrow?" into a far better land of promise. Oh, oh, my son, do not let us be slothful because of the easiness of the way. For so was it with our fathers. For so was it, was it prepared for them that if they would look, they might live. Even so it is with us. The way is prepared. And if we look, wait, wait and if we will look, we may live forever. And now, my son, see that ye take care of these sacred things. Yea, see that ye look to God and live. Go unto this people and declare the word and be sober, my son. Farewell. Oh, I love this. And I got chills when he said farewell. Like, no, don't leave. You know. So something Redhead Hostess suggests is to read. Uh, it would be a good idea to read these scriptures with your family and have each person decide a word that describes their level of diligence. Have them imagine what it would be like if they had a Liahona in their room they could look at every day for guidance. Would they use it? How often would they use it? Or would they just set it on the shelf and forget about it? <laughs> right? The truth is they do not have a Liahona. Or the truth is they do have a Liahona. God has given us the scriptures, the Holy Ghost and the word of prophets to guide us today. The way is prepared. And if we will look, we may live forever. All right. Um, I got to get going and perfect timing because this is the end here for chapter 37. And this is our read it, live it. You probably can't see it because I'm 
moving. It says, do the small and simple things, then look for the great things. Oh, I love that. Do the small and simple things, then look for the great things. Right? And I would add, write them down. Because then you can remember. And when we write those things down, we have ammo against Satan to help us during those times when he's discouraging us. We can go back and be like, no, 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 no. See right here, this is where I experienced this. So you can't make me forget it. Hold on to those core memories of testimony. All right. Until Alma chapter 38. Stay strong, warrior.